American democracy. When he gets here, Mark, uh, when he gets off that plane into the vehicle for onward travel in D.C., we're not expecting to see him uh, before he enters the building. I think the plan is to take him in the back uh, into the garage, which clearly would have uh, security advantages. Um, there is a, a travelling pool of reporters, as we understand it, so uh, one imagines we'll see uh, pictures of him, probably hear from him, I would guess, and uh, we're expecting to hear from his legal team at some point. Bear in mind that this is as much about the politics for Donald Trump as it is about the criminal legal aspects. This is, for him, a fundraiser. This is a chance for him to make political capital out of the indictments served against him. And we've seen that, haven't we? We've seen his stock increase. We've certainly seen his cash increase. And since the indictment was served, indictment number three, he has issued eight fundraising emails. He is grifting off these alleged crimes. The question will be, what kind of defence does he form to try to beat uh, this indictment? There's much talk. Indeed, his lawyers uh, have given a clear sense that there are two strands to the defence. One, the First Amendment, free speech. The second one, uh, the fact that he was merely acting on legal advice. He was a misguided innocent in all of that. I think there are weaknesses in both those defences, if that is indeed the root of, uh, the root of uh, a defence case. The free speech, yes, free speech is protected in this country. When it comes to speaking on a street corner about which political party you think people should vote for. But free speech, free speech is a crime when it is wired in to the commission of a crime, when it is part of a conspiracy, people getting together and conducting speech that relates to the commission of a crime, the planning of a criminal enterprise. So that's the weakness on that one. In terms of acting on legal advice alone as a, an innocent, then what lawyer is going to step forward and say, yeah, uh, I advise my client that it was OK to lie, that it was OK to lean on officials at state and federal level to subvert democracy, to submit false slates of electors and essentially you know, conduct a criminal enterprise? Uh, I would wager that very few lawyers will, would take any part of that. And uh, an interesting point by association is, you know, there are six... Uh, co-conspirators named on the indictment. Four of them are attorneys. Which of them, I wonder, are going to stick with Trump and testify on his behalf? Or how many of them will actually flip, will turn away from Trump and say, look, uh, I actually don't fancy the rest of my life in jail. I'm going to tell prosecutors exactly what was said in our private meetings. And you imagine the good money on that would be on lawyers testifying against Donald Trump. James, uh, well, thank you very much. Very interesting point you make there because, um, well, what about the position of Mike Pence, his uh, um, vice president, uh, running mate now, running against him? Uh, big question as to whether he would... I um, mean, he's, he's heavily features in the indictment. There's a question about whether he would actually give uh, evidence against uh, Donald Trump in court. Well, talking us through the events in court this evening is uh, Michelle Bradford, a former prosecutor for the US Attorney's Office uh, for the District of Columbia. Um, thank you very much uh, uh, for talking to us, Michelle. Well, I mean, this court appearance will make history. Um, uh, we can say, I assume, that these are the most serious charges he faces of the three indictments thus far. Absolutely. I mean, I think everyone was kind of holding their breath to see would there be some charges tied to the January 6 events. This indictment gets to the heart of that. Certainly, conspiracy to defraud the United States is one of the most serious charges you can face in the criminal justice system. And so it seems like this indictment is really going after the heart of the matter. It's not just dealing with ancillary matters such as the documents, the classified documents. This is dealing with the heart of the actions that led to the January 6th um, riots. Right. And, I mean, serious because, as you suggest, it's about undermining democracy in the United States. Um, using lies that the prosecution is going to suggest that he knew 
were lies and uh, about this fraudulent election. See, um, a lot of throughout the indictment, there are quotations used. So they're quoting people, and the only way you get quotations is through recorded statements, through emails and documents, or through grand jury transcripts. So the fact that they are they have the recorded statements, that really shows the strength of the government's case and why they took the time to really make this indictment as thorough as it is. Because it's not required that they go into this level of detail, but I think it was important for them to do that, especially because they needed to address one of Donald Trump's main arguments, right? That he had a First Amendment right to make these statements. I mean, they addressed that within the first four paragraphs of the, comp of the indictment, that this is not about him complaining or being unhappy with the election. This is not about him making statements that the election was rigged and unfair. This is about a concerted series of actions that he took along with the co-conspirators to undermine our dem uh, democratic election. Yeah, and it's interesting, there are legal experts who are saying that it, you know, it may not be that easy to make these charges stick, that prosecutors have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Trump knew there was uh, no fraud, and to prove that is quite difficult. You know, it is hard to prove fraud because a lot of it rests on the defendant's intent. But I think that's why this indictment is so thorough. And I think that's why the prosecutors took the time to really lay out conversations, to lay out details. We know that there were conversations that were happening. We know that there were documents that were being drafted to aid in this scheme, this alleged scheme. And so while conspiracy cases are hard to prove, typically, the fact that they have so much concrete evidence is really going to assist them in proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, that doesn't mean there's a guarantee. I'm sorry, there's a musical parade walking by us right now. So I'm going <laughs> to let them pass. Don't, don't worry, we can hear you. Um, so it does not... It does not mean it's going to be easy by any means, especially in the District of Columbia. You have a very savvy jury pool, and this jury pool will expect the government to prove its case. And the fact of the matter is, Donald Trump doesn't have to prove anything. He has no burden as a defendant in our criminal system. He could sit the entire trial and not put up one witness, not cross-examine anyone. The government has the absolute burden of proof to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. That said, there are sufficient allegations in this indictment that, if they can prove them, may help the government prove its case. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, the, in the indictment, there's a lot from Trump's inner circle, certainly. But I saw uh, Trump's lawyer, John Lauro, on um, television in America, and he said, he said this, uh, Michelle, I would like to see them try to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Donald Trump believed that these allegations about voter fraud were false. I'd like to see them try to prove that. Well, based on the allegations in the indictment, they, we know how they're going to try to prove that. They point to conversations by um, political officials in almost all of the seven states that were targeted, and those officials are quoted or given detailed statements to the effect that we told Donald Trump this had no merit. They point to statements by members of his, um, his own inner staff, his inner circle, people who were saying, there is no merit to this. We are not finding the widespread fraud that you are alleging. So, yes, he can say, well, I didn't know, but the government is going to be able to call those witnesses to the stand who will say, we told Donald Trump that there was no merit to his claims. OK, and just very briefly, and... Um... Finally, for now, what do you think will happen to him uh, when he gets to court? I mean, are we going to go through fingerprints, mug shots, all that kind of stuff? He probably won't do a mug shot, but he probably will be fingerprinted in the, in the courthouse. They have a booking area where you walk through the booking process. Then he will go up to the, court, the courtroom. Um, and the arraignment is really a... a sh typically a pretty short proceeding where, in this case, because he's indicted, uh, the judge will ask whether he wants a formal reading of the indictment. Most defendants waive the formal or full reading of the indictment, and she will ask his attorney to enter his plea, and we expect in this case he will enter a plea of not guilty to each of the four charges. 
Then a new date will be set for the, for the parties to appear before the district court judge. The magistrate judge will address issues of release. I expect in this case that he will be released on his personal recognizance. He is a defendant in um, several other proceedings, and it doesn't seem that there's any reason to think he is a flight or a danger to the community. So he will likely be released um, and return for his next court date, which will be before the assigned district court judge. OK, Michelle, thank you very much uh, indeed. I think we're joined now by Bill McGinley, former Cabinet Secretary in the Trump administration. Uh, indeed, we are. Um, Bill, thank you very much for uh, talking to us. And, well, I suppose it's another difficult day for Donald Trump. Uh, sure. I mean, any time you, you, you're, you're, you have to be arraigned in federal court after a federal indictment has been handed down against you by a grand jury, it's not a good day. Um, but I think as we've seen with the previous indictments, both by the Manhattan DA and also by um, the special counsel's team down in the, in the city of Miami, um, you know, Donald Trump has been able to politically inoculate himself with Republican voters and actually try and turn it into a strength, not a weakness. Um, these are very serious charges, but I think his team is, is making the best, doing the best that they can uh, to help him remain politically viable in the Republican presidential nominating process. I mean, they are serious charges. They're basically about lies, lies to the American people. That's the accusation. I just wonder whether this might be the, the day that Trump's lies catch up with him. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of um, First Amendment case law, both from the Supreme Court and the federal courts, um, that the government of the United States um, under the First Amendment is not allowed to be the arbiter of truth. Now, the indictment lays out a lot of um, witnesses who were either before the grand jury or potentially the January 6th committee, who I believe shipped all their evidence over to Jack Smith's office, um, talking about how they told the former president um, that there was no evidence of fraud that could stand up in court um, that they were finding post-election. Um, the issue is, is that uh, the First Amendment does protect um, some pretty robust speech, including some caustic speech that may not be tethered um, in the truth, there was a statute in the state of Ohio that prohibited false statements about other candidates that was struck down on uh, First Amendment grounds. So I do think that the defense team is going to take a serious look uh, at the evidence and probably file some motions to exclude evidence uh, or have some of the charges thrown out that may be based on false statements. Um, and we'll see it work th its way through the courts. It may eventually reach the Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the problems, I guess, for him is that the indictment is quite detailed, including um, uh, material from his own people um, within the White House who seem to know that he was, you know, that he was lying. It seems quite clear. I mean, the campaign advisor who said this is conspiracy stuff uh, hand, handed down from the mothership, uh, one of his White House counsel... Uh, a lawyer said, there is no world, there is no option in which you do not leave the White House on January the 20th. So, I mean, th that's all pretty awkward for Donald Trump. Uh, look, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, one thing I can say is that, you know, this is the uh, opening bell um, of this trial. Um, defense counsel is not allowed in the grand jury room. Defense is not allowed to present evidence in the grand jury. Uh, the indictment is written by the prosecutors, so this is one of their best shots at laying out their case and trying to establish the narrative uh, through a speaking indictment, as your previous guest just said. Um, what's going to happen now is that the defense uh, legal team is going to be able to get their hands on the evidence, plus take discovery of their own. Um, and so we'll see how much of the narrative stands up over time um, after the former president's lawyers have a chance to go through it file their motions and try and narrow the scope of the, uh, the indictment, if not try to get it thrown out. As a Republican, is there not a sense in which you feel, Bill, that maybe uh, Donald Trump should stand down to spare the country this, uh, the ordeal that it's going to go through? Uh, you know, it's, I don't know if you guys had seen the New York Times uh, poll that was released earlier this week. Um, I think a lot of people... Uh, including uh, President Trump's supporters, um, were frankly surprised at the strength of his support amongst Republican primary voters across all demographics. How, how, in the how does that happen? Mass. How does that happen, Bill? 
I think it's because there, you know, a lot of people on the Republican side talk about the sense that there's uh, uh, two systems of justice, one for Republicans uh, and then one for uh, uh, Democrats. And I think that's really taken hold. And I think the president's, the former president's team has done a pretty good job uh, messaging to the Republican uh, primary voters, you know, look, I'm standing up for you and the establishment uh, in Washington, D.C. doesn't but, like but me. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's true? What's there that? is. Do you think that's true? There is separate systems of justice for Republicans and Democrats? No, look, I, I really believe in, in the American um, judicial system. I think mm. that um, every defendant is entitled to the presumption of innocence. Um, I think that every defendant has a right to counsel and that they are entitled to due process and to put on their case. Um, I think that includes President Trump um, and anybody else who is charged with the crime, either under the federal or state courts. Um, and I just I, I think this is going to play out. You know, I know that the special counsel's office is trying to get a speedy trial and get a trial date uh, well in advance of the general election in 2024. Um, I think a lot of um, former prosecutors and criminal defense attorneys are a bit skeptical that they're going to be able to pull off a trial date that soon, right. um, that this will probably go beyond the general election next year. Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens then. Bill McGinley, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. We'll be back uh, to Washington as Donald Trump heads to uh, court. Plus, we'll have more of the day's news uh, after the break. It completely contradicts what she stands for. So, from a reputational perspective, it's it, it's a she's in a really bad position. It's very hard. So, I have clients who have also faced legal situations, and we are very, very heavily managed by the legal team. So, we have some legal teams who are far more understanding of how desperate the celebrity and the PR team would generally be to get something out because silence from a general public perspective is really frustrating and they're desperate to hear the other side of the story. But I, what I will imagine is, I think eventually they will put together a very strategic um, statement. Um, I think they'll probably deny it, um, really push that body confidence is her brand um, and that she is a champion for that and address the accusations at hand. It could be really a really terrible for her to be honest because it really does go against everything she's ever stood for um for if she was my client right now it's the other reliable sources that are coming forward and also speaking out and sort of defending those who are making these claims against her um i think that's gonna be quite a striking problem for her team today because if that was it's just further evidence that this could be true um, and makes it a lot more harder to defend it. It rose for the 14th time in a row today and now stand at 5.25%. There was more bad news from the Bank of England, however, as they warned rates will stay higher for longer to battle soaring price rises. Here's our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. Hanging by a thread. With interest rates rising, businesses and households are under ever greater pressure, ever more likely to dip into the red. Like many, this textiles company took on extra debt during COVID. Debt that's now getting much more expensive. The current level of demand within manufacturing is softening. And um, 
because of the interest rate changes, financing within a business is becoming increasingly more expensive, uh, you know, thousands of pounds a month. And that is a direct cash flow hit on the bottom line. And it's something that we aren't getting much sympathy for from government. Or from the Bank of England. Not only has it raised rates, it's signalled that they may have to stay higher for longer. We've got to get inflation back down to target. Now, I think it will come down quite substantially by the end of the year. It won't be back to target. We've got more to do next year and we will do it. But it is on the way down now. If they're right that interest rates are going to be higher for longer, then that has all sorts of other implications. It means borrowing is lower, investments lower, the economy, well, they may not be forecasting a recession, but when you look at the projections, they are talking about not just a few months, but a few years of flatlining. That is pretty bleak. Let me give you a sense of what that means. This line is the size of the UK economy, total national income. Before the 2008 crisis, it was rising quite fast. Then it took a dive, but seemed to be recovering until COVID. But here's where that bleakness comes in, because today's forecast from the bank means we're now on a completely different trajectory. There's so many exciting things. The Chancellor insists he's doing what he can. We should recognise that there is a lot of pain for families for businesses, the process of getting there is very tough. And so what we have to do is to stick to the plan to get there as quickly as possible, because once we get inflation down, you can start to see a path where interest rates will come down and that will relieve the pressure on families with mortgages. And that's what obviously we want to happen as soon as possible. For those who've paid off their mortgages, higher rates might be good news, higher returns on their savings. But for those with mortgages, especially those like Joe on a floating rate deal, it's a recipe for disaster. It's really stressful because um, I'm thinking, what, what's left? Where, where else can I go with this? What else can I do? Um, sleepless nights, having to think about cutting everything out, basically, just to survive and keep, keep the house. Um, and I thought having one full-time job, thought, you know, I've worked all my life full-time, that would be enough, but in this day and age it's not enough. This period of difficulty won't last forever, but, says the bank, it might last that bit longer than many had expected. Ed Conway, Sky News. With us this evening are Linda Yu, economist at the uh, University of Oxford and the London Business School, and Ray Bulger from the mortgage advisory firm John Charcoal. Uh, good evening to you both. Uh, Linda, first of all, so interest rates still on the way up. So um, presumably then members of the MPC still worried about inflation. They are. So the rate of inflation has slowed, but if you look at core inflation, which is the underlying measure of how much prices are rising, because that, that strips out energy and food from the headline CPI figure, I mean, that figure is close to 7%. And that's why uh, they have said that they, uh, you know, are likely uh, to have higher rates for longer until inflation starts to slow. Now, this is something which other central banks are also facing. I should say the Fed and the European Central Bank both raise rates, but unlike the UK, they seem to have slightly better core inflation. So they have signaled that uh, rates may have peaked in the US and in the Eurozone. But just to underscore, Mark, how uncertain it is, the European Central Bank President, Christine Lagarde, when asked, is this it, she replied, it's a decisive maybe. So that just tells you how uncertain um, inflation is at the moment. Yeah, but a peak soon, where, I mean, what, where do you think they will peak? Well, at the moment, at 5.25%, there probably will be another increase. Uh, the markets are expecting by the end of the year or so, so that takes it to five and a half. Markets are expecting that in the spring of next year, and this has fluctuated quite a lot, it could at one point, um, it was forecast to reach about 6.5%. Right. With slowing inflation, um, especially in the latest figures, that's come down a bit. But we're still talking somewhere between where we are now and possibly over 6%. Right. So that range, of course, is familiar to people who remember the economy before 2008, when yeah. average interest rates were 5%. But that is quite a, that's quite a change from what we had over the past decade. It certainly is. And with that in mind, Ray, uh, what does it mean then for those with mortgages, particularly those with decisions to make about, you know, whether to fix or not? 
Well, the, the good news in terms of the fixed rate front is that the market had fully anticipated this quarter point rise in bank rate. And there's been very little change in the cost of funds since the decision. So I don't think we will see much change in the prices for two and five year fixed rate mortgages. If you've got a big deposit, two year fixed rates start at about 5.9% and five year fixed rates at about 5.4%. And it looks like those rates are going to stay pretty well the same until we get some more data. So the key thing to watch is going to be when we get the next inflation figures, um, depending on what they say, the market will then start to anticipate what the Bank of England is going to do. But for the next couple of weeks, I think uh, people can expect mortgage rates to, to stay broadly unchanged. If you've got a tracker, of course, obviously you're going to see your rate go up by a quarter of a point. If you're on a discount from standard variable rate, you may or may not see the full impact of the increase because as rates have increased, many lenders have not been increasing their standard variable rate as much as bank rate. Um, so the only people who are definitely going to see an increase after this change are those on a tracker. Well, it's interesting. I know uh, some uh, people who have opted for trackers in the hope that rates will, you know, come down next year and, and uh, you know, the year after. But uh, that, from the sound of it, may not necessarily happen. Um, I think there is a good argument at the moment for people to look at trackers. I mean, the cheapest tracker mortgages are about a quarter of a percent above bank rate. So they're now going to be costing five and a half percent. Compare that with a two-year fix, which will cost you close to 6%. So you can afford to see bank rate go up another half point before you're worse off. And the chances are bank rate's going to start to come down before the end of two years. And of course, if you're in a tracker, most tracker deals don't have any earlier repayment charges. So you can then decide to stay with it as rates come down or lock into a fixed rate when you think the time is right. Yeah. So whereas... For most of the last 10 years or so, the choice has been whether to take a two- or five-year fixed rate. I think now the choice is more, do you take a tracker or a longer-term fixed rate? Uh, it's interesting. Um, Linda, so it's the f uh, 14th increase in a row. Just finally, are they giving the interest rate rises that have already happened enough time to have an effect? Because, I mean, there must be a drag. Yeah, that's a very good point. So they've been raising rates since December 2021. On average, it takes two years for the full impact of a rate increase to pass through. So we should see the impact towards the end of this year. Once it starts to really affect uh, the economy, higher borrowing costs dampens economic activity. But the bank today, they forecast that the UK won't enter into recession um, this year suggesting that there's more resilience in the economy. So raising rates now anticipates that they will not hit the inflation target for another two years. And that's roughly what the forecasts say. The one big, um, well, well, there's lots of different factors, but one big factor is if the forecast isn't quite right and the economy isn't as resilient as they think, because for instance, Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.